the original seats from 1975 when they first built that studio, except for a couple of them that like broke. No? From Yankee Stadium. When they were redoing Yankee Stadium in the 70s, they took out all the seats, and the SNL, they, they stole all the seats, and they put them in the studio, and those are still the seats that you have to sit in at one in the morning on Saturdays. Who knew? All right. Um, nothing, no, everyone, wow! Some excitement, whoa! Okay, go Yankees, yes, sir. Very good, sir, okay. All right, so we did introductions. We're going to move on to our first talk. Seth, would you like to come up and plug in uh, a, a device of any kind that you're going to share on the thing? Um, OK, so uh, I usually have notes about, my, about the speakers. I don't have those today. So I'm just going to wing it and say that this is Seth Fisher. Seth worked for me about 230 years ago. And uh, now he, he, he's working, he's living down in Philly and he's working for, I forgot the name of it already. Teodi. Um, and he's, he's doing a lot of remote development and, uh, and he's an awesome guy and he's got a lot of interesting things to say. So he's going to uh, plug himself in and we're gonna, we're gonna try and, where's that guy? Can you, can you switch the input for me? In, on the, yeah, thank you. Um, and we're gonna get the input switched and I'm gonna stand up here and riff for a second while we do that. Um, but I, I really, I went through all my material with the, the World Cup thing, so I'm good. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right, so Seth Fisher, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! It looks fine. It looks good. Talk into it. Yeah. Move that closer to the face. All right. Yeah. Maybe this one's a little bit better, I think. Thank you. Word. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that seems like it'd be better. So, I am uh, Seth Fisher. I am a uh, lead Drupal developer. I guess I should put that little adjective at the beginning for uh, Teodi, which is a Washington DC based uh, uh, development shop agency. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, we're looking for Drupal devs, specifically backends. So yeah. Um, and I started working there recently. I live in Philly. Uh, I used to live in New York, obviously, if I was working for Alex. So I'm going to talk about migrating my personal site revolutionary output from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, and let's jump right into it. So what is this, as in what is this site? Um, so let's kind of take a look at it real, uh, real quick like. So this is uh, Socialism and Orange is the New Black, which is basically um, I took the um, about 25 characters or so from Orange is the New Black. You can see it here in this uh, menu. Um, there's a few that are combined, like I did Piper and Pusey together, I did the Golden Girls together, and I did Diana Leiter, uh, Mom and Daughter, together. And there's like 25 or so of those. Um, and I basically tried to look at what would their lives be like in a socialist political economic system. And I was asking the question and sub-questions, would they be in prison? And would they have taken the same actions? And if so, would those actions be illegal in that system? Uh, you could call it fan fiction, if you will. I will not, but uh, you know, in the uh, colloquial vernacular, that's probably the most uh, appropriate term to help understand what the site is. So yeah, created in D7, migrated to D8. Um, so let's go right to what the challenges were. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, video color box links in the body text, which I call the frying pan. So in Drupal 7, the solution to do this was um, yeah, there's my water, it's hiding, was to use the color box load feature of the color box module and just create anchors right in the body text that just had a class equals color box load. And I'll uh, show you what that looked like in D7. So first, here's the actual functionality. Um, 
Frankenstein's as a version of the spoilers. So, uh, just to show you how that's, uh, did I actually, I don't think I logged into the site on here. Um, I don't want to spend the time logging in. So basically, just to give you an idea of how that's built, uh, you would just have the anchor right in the, uh, in the body text, and yeah, you would just put this um, color box load, this other stuff, init color box load process and C box element. That's why I should have logged into the site before, but I forgot to do it. Um, that's going to get put in there by the module automatically, but color box load I put in there, and the href and the parameters and then the, the text in between the anchor tags. So it's not the greatest way to enter content, but it wasn't bad either. It was a pretty simple solution, and it worked well in uh, Drupal 7. But in Drupal 8, uh, what do I do? First thing, obviously, when you're trying to move a site from D7 to D8 is you try to replicate the functionality. You try to use the same modules, see if they were already ported, et cetera, et cetera. So the color box module was ported to D8, and actually um, the color box load and color box inline uh, components of that were split out into their own modules. They were part of color box in D7, but no longer. So I was looking, and there was no way to do it. The um, external URLs were were not working. So I said, okay, let me take a look at the module and see if I could patch it. You know, Maybe when they ported it, they forgot the functionality to make it work for external URLs. So I went into the, uh, into the code, let me full screen that or whatever. And uh, by the way, I'm kinda, I like to navigate when I do something like this through the directory and stuff because I think it, it's good as a sort of teaching tool or whatever to help you understand if you sort of look at the navigation rather than just having it open already. But um, anyway, here's ng lightbox, which actually the color box module is dependent on in Drupal 8. It leverages ng lightbox. So I started digging around and pretty quickly I found this, which I thought was kind of funny, is if you look at the, um, the, the file for this, the like very first function is ng lightbox enabled path and then it sends a URL. And the first section of code there is says, no light box on external URLs. So they did not forget they purposely are not supporting this functionality. So when I saw that, I said, well, I'm not going to deal with this because this is going to involve, I got to talk to the maintainer and figure out why it's like this and try to understand. I don't have time for this. I'm just going to try another solution. Strike one. So uh, next, I said, I'm going to try to create uh, video media entities and link to them via color box load. And to sort of show you what that looks like, I have set up like a little local demo site. And by the way, I'm just going to mention this really quick. I'm doing this in a private browser window because the, um, the autoplay functionality with YouTube videos with uh, video embed field is actually... Um, if you're logged in as administrator, it doesn't work because there's a permission that uh, allows you to see uh, or yeah to see autoplayed um, videos in YouTube, but it's like a negative permission kind of thing. So you know, admin gets all permissions. So automatically, admin gets a permission that basically says don't autoplay videos. And it's great if you're developing a site and you don't want to constantly be bothered by your autoplayed videos. But when you're working on autoplayed videos, it's annoying. So it's kind of a, you know, catch 22 or whatever. So I have this open in, um, in a private browser window for that reason. So let's look at what, um, and even before I, I go into this, so I have one video here in a block, which is using the, uh, just your standard, uh, a field for video embed field in the block. And then there's this, which is a node and then it has, and you'll see if you look at the lower left, you see the link to media slash two. So that's a link to the, um, the video media entity. And that entity itself is going to get rendered in the color box. So that was the second solution that I tried. And I just want to say for a second, the reason why I needed to have both working, where like if I didn't need this thing in the, in the sidebar, it would have made it a lot easier. But because I had to have it working two different ways, it, it was more complicated. It's because I had this um, this video in the sidebar, which is um, Red Talk, Our Socialist Future, about uh, gender and sexuality and things like that. I actually filmed this a couple years ago, and I think it's excellent. It's about an hour-long talk, and I referenced this thing probably about a dozen times in all the write-ups in here. And uh, 
So I needed that to work in the sidebar, plus all the videos that I have in the actual body. So, um, yeah, if we take a look at this, this is what it looks like coming from the video embed field. Love when you can see the guy's breath there. Um, so now this is what it looks like when you have the media entity embedded in the node. And you'll see that it obviously doesn't look the same. So as you could see there, the size was obviously like a lot different and things were cut off or whatever, but that wasn't even really the worst problem. I could have probably lived with that. But then if we go back to the other video, you'll see pretty quickly why this is a problem. Yeah, <laughs> not acceptable. So um, at that point, I looked at that and I said, this is gonna involve me digging in and trying to understand why it's remembering what the size of the color box was from the one that's inside the node. I'm gonna have to do custom coding. This is gonna be a ton of work and troubleshooting. So I said, you know what? This isn't really the best solution that I could come up with anyway. And if I have to do custom coding, I might as well just do it a better way. So, strike two! And, um, yeah, so next, I thought of this other solution, which I didn't even bother building, like, a demo for this because it's just so ridiculous. When you hear me describe it, you'll see how absurd it is. So kind of like how that was one layer of abstraction where we were embedding the video media entity in the node, this approach was two layers of indirection where I created a node that would contain the text for the link and then uh, I was using this module called uh, Colorbox Field Formatter where you can take that link and then have another field which is an entity reference to the video media entity and it would open that field, render that entity in a color box, and then the entity itself, kind of like the first solution, would play the video. And uh, I basically ran into very similar issues with that, so um, I ended up not going that way either. And uh, for those of you that were following the baseball metaphor with the strike one and the two, if you thought third time was gonna be a charm, uh, no, tricked you. Sneaky Pete. She's just as confused as you are. So, ultimately, the solution I went with that, uh, spoiler alert, sorry, Frank Costanza, that worked was to create a field formatter for video embed fields, or what I like to call the sneaky Mel from Frasier solution, which is uh, dedicated to sneaky Mel from Frasier. Still so confused. And uh, I don't know if this is violating any copyrights of NBC, but God, I hope so. <laughs> uh, so, basically the, um, the path to, to go here is to create a color box text link using the entity's label field to the video. And I did some digging and I found, fortunately, a patch that got me pretty close to where I needed to be, which was really you know, nice to see that I wasn't gonna have to write this from scratch. So uh, if we take a look here at the, uh, <laughs> at the patch that existed already, um, I'll actually uh, pull up the image here that comes with this patch. This developer did a great job here of putting this in here, which makes it easy to see what it does. So they basically added this little area here, this little input area to use, so the way that it works, uh, currently with um, adding color box links is you can only use an image uh, that would show as like a thumbnail or a full image or whatever where you click the image and then that brings up the color box. Whereas what I need obviously is to have text that would then be clickable to bring up the color box. So this person added functionality where you can add text, like you can see right here, thumbnail or text, and then there's the, the check boxes that don't currently exist. And the one thing that was different that didn't meet my needs was they set it up to do it for only one uh, like constant string. So if you wanted to have all of your links, let's say have text that says trailer on your site that bring up videos, you could do it this way. But obviously for me, I need that text to be different every time. So um, I was able to leverage what that person did and extend it and... Um, 
get it to essentially the final product of this, and I'll, again, I could have opened this before, but I like to, you know, march through the menu and whatnot. So structure, media types, video, manage display, and we're off. Color box modal with link. This is the formatter that I added from uh, editing this person's patch. And then if we look at uh, what this looks like now, so I took kind of that area and I extended a little bit, added an extra checkbox, changed the language so that it would make like what I thought was a little more sense. So now you can choose the entity label. And for those of you that don't know, this thing about a uh, label is actually kind of interesting to note if you don't know this. Uh, if you have a node, the label field is title, but if you have like a video media entity or some other kind of media entity, the label field is name. So there's a method on entities in Drupal called get label that will basically figure that out for you. So it kind of knows what the label is for that particular type of entity. So that way I was just able to call that method and be agnostic as to what, what kind of entity it was, not worry, is it title, is it name, whatever. It, so that was really cool. So here, if you wanted to use that person's patch, you could just click use default text and here's your text. And uh, otherwise use entity label and it automatically figures that out. And uh, as I showed you already with uh, in the private browser window, this was kind of a, a demo of that. And then this is on the live uh, Drupal 8 site. Uh, if we want to look at, what's a good one here? <laughs> yeah, I'll be referring to Nikki a few times, but uh, just take a look at this one real quick. This is one of my favorites. There is. There's a very good reason why you brought his dirty, dirty undies. If you watch that film, you'll you'll know why. Um, so that's um, that's basically that. That's what I had to do to get the functionality working. And now we're going to talk about uh, doing the actual migration and creating these video entities, uh, video media entities, which I call the fire. If you remember earlier, the frying pan. Now we're into the fire. So. There are two options for um, porting these over, and I actually did it both ways. I did it the first way just because it was kind of quicker to get it set up, and I like to kind of build momentum, get some things done, build confidence, etc. but it wasn't the best way, and eventually I ended up doing it the second way. But the first way is you create video entities on the fly during node migrations. So think of it like this. You're migrating your nodes, and as you're going through each node, you would basically parse the body text, find all the anchors, and for each anchor that matches one that should be a video, you just kind of on the fly run your, you know, save entity, whatever functions that create the entity. And uh, this is a fairly simple way to do it, but the drawback is that there's no rollback mechanism because you're not actually tracking this through the migrate module. So it's kind of a fast but sloppy way to do it. And the second way to do it is kind of the, the proper way to do it, but it's more involved, which is to create a custom video migrate source plugin to create the video entities before you run the node migration. So you're basically going to parse the nodes first, create these video media entities, and then later you're going to run the node migration and do the nodes again. But this time, you'll already have the entities existing through the migrate module, and then you can just plop them in there. And I'm going to show you the plopping <laughs> later. Um, we're going to use what I talked about before. That's where the plopping comes from. But uh, the drawback to this, obviously, it was complex. And as it turned out, it was very complex to do it. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, but the advantage is you can use the migrate modules rollback mechanism. And it's great because if you're doing it the other way with on the fly, you every time you change something and you want to test something, you basically have to reload your database, re-import all your config. Otherwise, you're leaving dirty data in the database because you left yourself no way to clean it up. Whereas with this, you can just run your migration, say, ah, I got to change this, got to change that, and just run the migrate rollback command, and it cleans up all your data, and you see how much how much you have left to import. It gives you numbers and stuff. So it's a way better way to manage a migration, especially if you're doing like more complex stuff and working on a team, you definitely would want to do it this way. I would. Um, so now let's talk about this video migrate source plugin that I wrote here, which is kind of the meat of this talk, even though it took me, what, <laughs> 15, 17 minutes to get to? Jeez. Um, so the prerequisites for this are the video embed media module and creating a video media type with a video embed field. The reason why I bring that up is because when you install the media module, it creates four... Um, media types for you, one of which is video. However, 
it creates that type with the field that comes with it is assuming you're going to be uploading the videos and managing them locally on your server. Whereas what I wanted was the field to be a video embed field, which is what the video embed media module gives you, is to be able to create a video media entity with that field, makes it available to the entity. So I wiped out the video um, thing that the media module created, created my own with the video embed field as the type of uh, video that would be in it. You could just create a new one and call it something else, call it YouTube video, whatever you like. I just liked calling it video, so I did it that way. Um, so the big difficulty here was overcoming the one-to-one -one source to destination challenge of how the migrate module works, which, um, so essentially if we, I, I think we'll take a little bit of a look at the, uh, at the migrate module here. Uh, disadvantage of not opening your files is you gotta like dig through stuff. Um, so here's the, the source plugin and here is the actual, bu -bu 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 -bu. here's the actual um, YAML file for the migration which is, you know, it's nothing too uh, crazy here. Um, so basically for those of you that are unfamiliar with migrations, uh, Drupal uses terminology of source, process, and destination. You may have also heard of ETL, which is extract, transform, load, but I don't use that because I'm a Drupal developer. So um, basically source is where your stuff is coming from, whether it's a CSV file, another Drupal site, database, markdown files, wherever. And then you're going to take that source, you're going to process it, manipulate the data, do what you got to do with it to get it ready to be thrown into your destination, which is your new Drupal site. Um, and for this, it's, uh, I'm thirsty. Yeah, so uh, it requires writing a, a custom source plugin to get these videos ready. And this is where the real, the real challenge is and why it has to be done this way. Let's say you have um, 30 nodes or entities or whatever, and you want to bring them into Drupal. You can, at maximum, create only 30 destination nodes or entities. You can create less by using this skip on empty plugin, which I don't think comes with core migrate, but it comes with the migrate plus module, which um, I used, I think, quite a few of their plugins to write my, um, to write my plugins. Uh, so that's a really useful module to, to know about. And if you're using migrations, you're going to end up using that most likely. But anyway, um, you can't. And I tried like crazy to finagle this to say, okay, I have 30 nodes and during the process, I want to try to make the migrate module work and figure out, okay, I want to just throw some more rows into the source table. Like it wouldn't let me do that. You can't do it. You can't really touch the source table once you're in the process plugins. So this has to be done in, the, in a source plugin. It has to be done a, cer a certain way, unless you do it the other way that I mentioned, the kind of sloppy way. But um, Basically, that's the limitation. So if you wanted to do like fields, let's say, if you had like a name field, wi which would say contain like a first name, space, last name, and you wanted to split that into two new fields for first name and last name, that you can do very easily with Migrate. You would use, I think it's the explode method or the explode plugin, and you would just pass the name field to that, and then it would split it into two results and two, fiel and two fields, and same idea if you wanted to take two fields like that and concatenate them into one, like a first name and a last name, just make a new name field, you'd use the concat plugin and you could do that just the same. But for this, for actually creating more nodes than like what's already there, you can't do it. So I had to write this uh, kind of wild um, plugin here. So I'll just give like a brief overview of the um, of the algorithm and then I'm going to look at the code a little bit. I mean, I actually, just to kind of mention this at this point, I have a link at the very end here to, I gave this talk at uh, Drupal Delphia a few months ago and it was a longer talk so I went more in depth into the code. So if you're actually interested for whatever reason you want to torture yourself and listen to me talk for an extra 15 minutes, you could go to that and like watch that one. But um, I'm still going to go into this uh, a pretty good amount here too. So the algorithm is basically we have to parse all the nodes and extract all of the anchors. Now, I say all anchors and not all videos because I felt like when I was writing this, this is easier for other people to use if they want to take my code if I keep it to all anchors instead of kind of uh, splitting it into just videos because let's say you want to take images or documents um, using a similar methodology that are embedded in your old site and your uh, node bodies and convert them to entities. Well. If I've already written the code for video, then it's harder for you to do that. You can have to unwind it. But 
the way I left it was like, here's all the anchors and they're ready to go. Now in your process plugin, do whatever you need to do to get what you need. Like in my process plugin, I got only the videos. You may only want images or documents, whatever. So I felt like that would be kind of helpful for other people. That's why I did it that way. And semantically, I also felt like if I'm getting just the videos, that's kind of processing. So that should go in a process plugin for semantic reasons. But more, I was thinking about other people maybe using this. So um, the next piece, once you've extracted all the anchors, is we need to union these anchors together into a select object. And I'm gonna talk a whole lot about this. But uh, just so you know, and I put it here kind of at the end too, another way to do this instead of unioning would have been to just create temp tables, which in retrospect, as you'll see, would have been the simpler way to do it. And if I had it to do over again, knowing what I know now, I would do it that way. But at the time, I didn't know that and I thought it would be easier to use unioning. So that's how I did it. Um, and then you have to, once you've built the select object, you have to join it to the body table. And because we have to, we just do. This is based on how the migrate module is built to work and more specifically, what I consider limitations of the select object in Drupal 8 and I'm sure probably Drupal 7 too, although it doesn't have kind of the same objects, but I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so let's take a look at the actual uh, plugin here and let's see how deep I wanna get here. So we start looping, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, when I'm building the expressions here for the union, uh, for those of you that maybe have never done something like this, I actually, um, so each expression, if you think of it, if you have like 80 videos, right, 80 anchors, each one is gonna be a row that you're gonna have unioned. So when you pass this to the database, you're gonna wanna pass uh, a variable, because I'm storing obviously all the values in a variable, and there's gotta be a variable name associated with that, but it can't all have the same variable name because when the query actually gets executed, it's once all 80 rows or whatever are built and it's ready to run the query, the expression is gonna be like, let's say your variable name is X, it'll be X all 80 times, and then for the last time that you set X, that's gonna be the value for the entire query. So all of them would get to the same, get set to the same value, which you do not want. So I basically had to, while I was looping, keep track of the count of the anchors and use that to kind of build a dynamic variable name for each row so that you would make sure that you have a unique variable and you could get 80 or whatever different uh, values so that it would build it properly. And just to um, note something else, I comment my code a lot and I explain all of this very thoroughly if you're interested and I skip over stuff here and you really wanna look into this, you could definitely look at my code and, and figure out what's going on here, I hope. I, I do my best to comment really well and really clearly. Um, and one piece I skipped over here, which is actually super important, is we need to select from dual, I'm gonna read this, I guess. We need to select from dual because the Drupal select object cannot create subqueries as base tables. And I wrote like so many comments on this later, but the bottom line is, let's say you're in MySQL or from what I remember of Oracle like 10 plus years ago when I used to work with it. If you wanted to select, let's say some constants like Bill, select Bill comma Smith comma 35 Main Street and build like a, a three row or a three column table from constants or whatever. You could just do that whole thing in parentheses and then outside the parentheses say like as my table and that works fine. Like that's good and then you could use that and join that with things and whatever and it's great. However, the select object in Drupal does not let you do that and this is like the key element here of the, the trouble that was involved that I was tearing my, ha my hair out over. You have to select from the dual table and when you do that, there's a limitation to whenever you're using the dual table, you can't use it on the left side of a join. So we're gonna see here in a second that I had to kinda set up this like annoying dummy query where I could have chosen any table, I just chose to select from the, uh, the field data body again, which is basically your uh, you know, node body table from Drupal 7 because I needed some real table that I could actually join with and take my huge union select object and join it on the right side with this other table. So this was just maddening and I wrote like a really big comment block here which explains all of this. But the bottom line is the migrate module is expecting you to pass it a select object and you cannot build the select object 
with a selection from dual on the left side of the join, so you need to have this other table. And there's one other way to do it, which I said here, which is one final method would be to use the prepare query method of a connection object to give you full control of the query string. Of course, this would entail rewriting the entire migrate module since that's expecting you to return a select object. Good luck with that. So um, to better understand all this, you could uncomment this line right here, which I left, which is a print R that shows you the actual query that gets executed. So you can see what all the unions and stuff, the query that actually gets built. And I was using this quite a bit when I was trying to figure out how to make this work. So if you care and whatever, uh, definitely uncomment that and take a look. Um, and then there's also this get IDs function, which again is related to having to do this just annoying, like kind of skeleton query to, to sit on the left side and do the join, and I commented this a lot too, but um, basically that's, you get the gist there, and I think that was in depth enough about kind of the limitations of the select object. I don't know why that has that limitation, why they didn't build it to do um, subqueries. I mean, it could have to do with not all database systems allow you to do that, that's possible. There could be other reasons. I don't know, I'm not familiar with the, you know, with those objects the way that Drupal core developers are. I'm sure they have their reasons. Like, I don't, I don't doubt that at all. But for what I just wish that it would have worked the way I wanted it to. So that's basically how I had to build that, um, that source plugin. And the algorithm, I think you can basically get the gist of that. It's fairly straightforward once you take out the difficulties of all the joining on the left side and that nonsense. So again, temp tabler would be simpler. But when I was creating this, I thought unioning would be easier because if you're talking about creating a temp table, you have to hit the database to create a, a table. Then you have to like build it and then put all the data there. Then you've got to hit the database again to pull the information back. And then you have to clean up after yourself and delete that temp table. Whereas you're in code anyway, why not just build an object that can be used without having to go back and forth with the database. To me, it seemed like a much better, more efficient approach. I just didn't know the limitations I was walking into. So this pretty much sums up my uh, experience with this right here. It was like, you know, I'm not down in uh, Gus's lab under the laundromat with Gail Boddicker and his notebook and all these fancy tools and whatever. Like, I'm in the RV, maybe with Mr. White, cooking up a quick batch of the blue sky. You know, I'm just trying to get this done as, <laughs> as easy as I can, but learn something at the same time, too. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip over these for time, the video migrate pro uh, process plugins. Um, basically, there's one to extract a video name, which is like a really simple one. The check to see if it's a video is it looks for that class equals color box load, which I mentioned way back at the beginning as to how I built the anchors initially. And then I extract the inner text and use it the video name, whatever, that's easy. Extracting the video href, I'll talk about a little bit because this one was definitely more involved. So we're looking to extract the YouTube video ID from the href and then transform the href to a video embed field compatible format so that um, the video embed field can actually render the, the video because it needs it to be formatted a certain way, which you kind of have to, by trial and error and looking at the code and stuff, you can figure this out. Um, so let me just take a little bit of a peeky here at, uh, at this one, at this migration plugin. Um, so really the interesting thing actually I want to touch on it's more about the content of the site than the actual algorithm here because I've done just about enough talking about code and algorithm and stuff. I think you kind of get the point. Um, but I had to build these two playlists because I have um, two playlists that I set up in YouTube. Um, one of them is called um, Socialism and Orange is the New Black Music. And the other one is sort of these uh, Seth videos. They're my videos. So I didn't really talk about this earlier. I kind of forgot. But basically, Attached to each write-up, to each character, there's a video, and you can kind of see my uh, silly little face here, where I talk, I actually did the videos first, and then I did these write-ups later, where I kind of talk about all this stuff or whatever, and this is a playlist in YouTube. And then I also have music, which accompanies the videos, so if I open one of these right here really quick. That's a little loud. Yeah, that was a little loud, but I turned YouTube down here so I wouldn't blow you guys away. Um, but... I needed to get these uh, playlist videos to work with uh, video embed field and there was a lot of trickery involved because the way the playlists work now in, um, in YouTube, which they didn't work in the past, was 
you have to pass in not only the um, playlist ID and the video ID. If you, let's say, have a playlist of 20 videos, it does not care what ID you pass it. It will always play the first video in the list unless you pass it an additional index parameter. So what I had to do was I created this array where I basically took the ID and I associated it with an index of you know what position it is in the um, in the playlist. And then once I had that, when I was building my new URLs, I just put that in the right place for YouTube to recognize it, and then it works. And I just had this other array for my videos where I basically had to do the same thing. Um, and I think uh, what else do I want to talk about with this? Uh, I was going to talk about other stuff with the playlist. Maybe I'll get to that. Maybe I won't. Um, so then the next piece to go through after those um, videos have all been created, now we have to actually embed those videos that we just created into the body links, which do you remember that patch from Days of Viewer that I spoke of? That's what we're going to need to embed. So um, this process plugin for the nodes, basically we're going to loop through each video anchor that we find in the node body, which matches class equals color box load, and we're going to query the migrate map table for that anchor as you know, the migrate table tracks all the, the stuff that you brought in already, which I did when I did the video migration. So that's the source of that information. Then, based on that, I load the video media entity so that I can extract the UUID. And then I create the video embed el element, and I insert the new element. So if we just briefly take a look at, uh, what was this called? It's been a long time. One <laughs> of five video links. Um, so uh, basically, this is the piece right here. To figure out how I had to build the element, what I did was, because um, you're using uh, Entity Embed to do this, really. So I just basically went in the WYSIWYG, clicked the button to embed an entity, embedded an entity, looked at the code that it gave you, and then I was able to use that to kind of figure out how I needed to build mine. It's, it's pretty simple. It wasn't really complicated or anything to build it. Um, and that's it. And then there's, there's a little interesting coding stuff going on here, which I'm not going to talk about. But again, you can read the comments if you're interested and dig deeper or watch the Drupal Delphia talk where I did talk about this a bit more. Um, so that's that with the pro, uh, plugins. Other business, um, I had to write three patches for um, video embed field that involved YouTube playlists um, to get it to support autoplay to get it to support position index, which I told you why I needed that, and to get it to support start time, which I'm just going to mention. Uh, I will go into this uh, briefly. So there was one video in one of the playlists that needed to start at seven seconds because for some reason there is seven seconds of silence in the video. So if we take a look at this, you see? That one started at six seconds because that's me basically telling it to start there. But if we click another video in that playlist and then we go back to that, the other video, you'll see that this actually starts at like zero and then it's seven seconds of silence. Who's got time for that, you know? Nobody has time for that. Like, when I want to get destroyed by Texas in July, I don't feel like waiting seven seconds. I want my destruction right now. So. That's why I needed to write that plugin for that one video. But um, So what I did was I created three patches and also a combined patch that I put on GitHub, and I kind of wrote a comment in, in the autoplay issue, and I said, look, if anybody's looking for all three of these together, I put them all together for you, for the maintainer, make your life easier. Or if you just want to take one or two, you have them individual, so give them options, kind of trying to think about you know, what works best for other people. Um, and let me just briefly talk about how I built the site. I'm just going to sort of show it to you quick. Um, so we've got, yeah, I should do that. That's why that button's there, silly. Um, so this is the article node, and then I put an EVA, Entity Views, attach view of all the characters underneath that. Um, pretty simple and straightforward for that. And then if we look at, let's say, Tucky, because this is the best gift that I have. I love this one. I'm going to watch it one more time. Yeah, pop it. All right, love that. This is also uh, quite an excellent picture as well, one of my favorites. Um, so this is the character node, and then I have two entity views attaches attached there. I basically have just the article attached as a, a view, and then I also have the rest of the characters attached. And I could have built this with one view attached and just done, like, give me all of the nodes and exclude the one on the page I'm on, certainly. But I just felt like 
it made more logical sense to look at this and see the article is attached and then all the other characters are attached. It just, I don't know, it seems simpler to me, even though maybe it's not as atomized as it could be or whatever. I think sometimes it's better not to if you can make what you're doing clearer to another developer, in this case, my future self, when I'm looking at my own code. So um, that's how that's built. And I wrote this um, uh, default content module. It's actually like a couple of, geez, <laughs> whoopsie daisy. Um, gotta go all the way. All right, at least it remembered where I was. So yeah. Um, just really quick on this module. Um, basically, it's kind of interesting because I had to, if you think about what like the architecture is here, I needed to get all of these blocks here um, in config, and this is the red talk, and then there's this Twitter block, which is maybe an interesting story, not gonna get into what this is all about and why I created that, but um, you need to first have a block type existing, so you have to have that code, then you need to create the block that's of that block type, and then you need to get that block into your theme. So I created, we don't need to open PHP, what am I doing, PHP storm, that's work. Um, so yeah, so the RevOut default content module, I created this RevOut block types module within it, and then gave it a dependency, gave the default content module dependency on the block type so that block types gets created first, and then this module gets enabled after the block type, so it can do that. And the great thing that I discovered about importing content in Drupal 8 is that it will actually import and enable modules first for you before it does the rest of your content. So this way, it creates the block types, then it creates the default content module with the block, and then once the rest of the config for the theme comes in and it's looking to throw the block in there, boom, it's already there and it works beautiful. So that was such a left swiper. That's some um, beautiful information to know about the, the config, uh, Drupal config importing. And theming, whatever, I don't even need to talk about this. I'm just gonna skip where I used adaptive theme. It's, it's a really cool um, responsive theme, base theme. I used it for D7 and D8, um, like it a lot. So um, to sum up, basically, here is a link to the site. Here's a link to the site repo. Here's a link to the rev out migration module. Here's a link to the default content module. And if you want to see the extended presentation where I talk a little bit more about the code and whatnot, um, you can click on this link here. Uh, so to sum up, this is your brain. This is your brain on Drupal. Any questions? Seriously though, any questions? Well, because video, the video field embed is also media entity. I, I was th just curious. I think it was the video, um, the video media embed module comes with video embed field, and then I think once I yeah. turned that module on, it like automatically turned on the media module in core. Oh yeah, I was I was just curious, like state of core media and those config tools and how, because media entity. Right, I, I think that's what it was. It automatically did it. Other questions? All right, thank you very much. Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Seth. So one thing I just want to point out is if anyone is ever looking for a job and you have to send a code sample, that is what your comments should look like. <laughs> Seriously, if you want to impress somebody who's hiring, write comments that look like that. Huh? Yes, I taught him everything he knows. No. Um, but no, seriously, when you have when you have crazy code and you have then you see comments like that, you go, ah, yeah, I'm in a good place. And this person knows what the hell they're doing. Um, okay, so thank you, Seth. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, 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 Scott and Mark, right? Robert. Robert. Is it Mark? I don't know. Um, so wh while you guys are, are getting yourselves all plugged in, Brian, come here. <laughs> come here. All right. So Brian is helping to organize uh, the couple dev days. So he's going to talk while they're setting up. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Um, just really quick plug. Um, me, uh, some of the guys from Acquia, Media Current, uh, Lullabot. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of us. And we've, we've uh, 
organized this decoupled Drupal summit. It happens in New York City. Uh, this is our second one. This one is happening at uh, the John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice. It's up in the Upper West Side. Uh, we're doing it um, August 17th to 19th. And the topics are going to be really cool. They're, they're quite um, advanced. They all have to do with headless Drupal, and they all have to do with all the permutations that one can pair a Drupal site uh, in some minimal repository form to a web application that could be written in React, it could be written in Angular, it could be a lot of different ways, and, and, and this is what this, this, this um, summit's about. And it really covers three kinds of um, uh, uh, topics. People who are in organizations who are interested in decoupling Drupal, organizations that have started to but not fully decoupled, and organizations who have done it and have something to share. So, really cool stuff. Uh, if you're interested, let me know. I've got some uh, information. Thanks, Alex. Got it. All right, thank you, Brian. All right, gentlemen, you are going to talk. We're, oh, we're going to we're going to switch the uh, the input, and then uh, you guys are going to talk about uh, monitoring the server. I'm going to give you the second mic, and that way you can both talk. So. So welcome. Now one of the great things about the computers and servers is that you can actually find what goes wrong in your system. And that's really great because I built a lot of things over the years, you know, from car engines to model kits, RC planes, all the devices, and they don't work for some reason, you get upset. The other great part about monitoring your server and looking at the logs is they can also detect security problems with your system. Because if you notice there's a processing runaway or other issues or weird logging attempts, it can help you. Now, the real problem is they're really boring to look at. They're pure text, they repeat themselves, and your mind go numb, and they like to break down and give you problems at two o'clock in the morning when you're already a little bit under the a little bit tired and don't really want to deal with it. But the service health is really directly related to its security. And we really have to configure all these logs, and we have lots of them. We have the, the Apache, the Engine X, we have mail logs, access logs, on and on and on. As I said, they're, they're no fun or hard to read. But the most important aspect is first to understand what you're reading, and then we're done with the real basic drab text-based logs. I'll show you some nifty tools. I'll pop into Munin for a few minutes so you can see a graphical interface, so you at least can see things, and discuss some of the tools that are out there that are free that you can put on your server that can alert you when there's a problem. Because really, it's about prevention and stop getting to the problem before your client finds out there's a, a serious issue going on. So, Robert, let's talk about the Apache config file. Before we talk about true config files, who has heard about the recent issue with Ticketmaster? Enlighten us. Silence. Ticketmaster apparently uses a third-party app for credit cards, which I'm assuming a lot of you in the room do. Well, that third-party app just had an issue. So you can read about it online if you want. But there's Ticketmaster. We all know of Ticketmaster, right? So big sites have problems. So why I keep bringing this up to Scott is so everybody in the room, no matter the size of your site, we're trying to emphasize the basics to protect you. Because it doesn't really matter how big or how small your site is or whether it's really flashy or boring. If it's been hacked and constantly getting corrupted, you get tired of that. So one of the issues I just saw recently with a site was a certain net block kept hitting the site. And on and on and on. And the automatic system would block it for an hour. Well. I looked at it and says, well, why, why am I doing this? I just want to block the whole net block permanently. And then I went to the extent of dropping the connections so my connections would free up. So that's the purpose of what we're talking about this. So you can have a good site and don't make the news in a bad way. You don't want to make the news only in a good way, but also realize if you have a small site but a lot of users that log on, you could be a target for them to realize to try and get passwords and usernames because they may not do anything to you, but they but most people are lazy and they use the same username for everything. 
and especially if you have a lot of you know sites that have no real financial matters, it's one thing they get to one to get to another to get another, and the hackers are active. That's all they do. They don't know if they have any other real life other than trying and hack and get information and distort things. And then you're the real criminals, the ones who work at to steal money from people. And it's, it, it's getting worse. It just it gets worse every day as we came more and more connected. So this is the basic Apache comp file. How many people in this room, I assume most people have played with this at one time in their lives. You know, it, it just tells you where everything is so you can find it. Because knowing where your error files are, where your access logs are, is half the battle if you don't know where it is. I get into situations where I get to a new server from a client or someone called me in, and they have no idea where anything is. Whoever built it beforehand never made any documentation. So now I'm going to spend 20 minutes figuring out where they move things to. One thing to note on the previous screen is you can set the level of the logs. Because remember, logs are your friends, but don't overdo it. The last line, log level worn. Right. So you don't want to have a, a log that grows exponentially, tells you every little annoying thing that goes wrong. But sometimes you do want to turn that on to try and troubleshoot it. But you got to be active on that. So this is it. So you the formats. So Robert's going yeah, to Yeah, you can always check the man page out. But actually, if you look at them, they actually kind of make sense. They got H for host, uh, R for agent, et cetera. You can figure it out. But it's pretty standard when you actually load the software. It gives you the same basic one. But you can customize it. And again, beware that the logs grow fast. You want interesting information. Now, the agent's important because it tells you what browser it's supposed to be. And so very often a hacker will go in and use a different agent to change it around. But you know it's the same IP address with different agents. That's a, that's a sign someone's trying to get into your system. It's also what uh, scrapers use. They try and disguise what they're doing. We don't know anyone who makes scrapers to scrape sites. Yeah, and here's just an example of a log. The print's a little small. You've probably seen it before, but again, it's just all the junk that comes in. And remember, the more junk that comes in, it's impacting your bandwidth, it's impacting your response time, it fills up your logs, it does you no good. So always set your log level to something that makes sense and always log what you need. And if you need to troubleshoot something, set it up higher, troubleshoot it, and then set it down again. But you really should go into your logs and take a look and sniff around, get you know self-familiar. So when you do have a crisis, you're not learning on, on the fly. Look at it, figure out the patterns. I mean, when I first began, the access log was the only way to find hits. I'd have to import everything to a spreadsheet, get rid of dupes, and it was a real process. That was before AW stats or any of that. So this is Nginx, and Nginx is another um, web server like Apache, Lighting, and so forth. A lot of people use Nginx. It has a lot of other functionality. That is a whole different conversation. But this is the Nginx configuration. Yeah, and again, you notice you can set the amount of data you need, the fields you need, and if you look in the, again with the man page, there's just a lot of fields you can log. And especially if you're behind uh, some sort of proxy or a front end, there's also other different fields you may want to log. Or you know behind you're a proxy, well, what good is it to keep getting the proxy IP in the log? You really want the real IP that comes in. And there are ways to transfer that IP into your log so you see the true IP and not the proxy IP. That's sort of one of those 101 things that beginners forget. It's funny, a friend of mine called me up and he had downloaded some music that he really should not have downloaded. And from a certain company, which will remain nameless, um, sent him an email that he was downloading illegal material and so forth. And he's calling me up, how can I VPN to something? and hide it. Kind of hard to hide all what you're doing because they'll figure it out sooner or later. So this is how you configure the, the virtual host in uh, Nginx and it's uh, where the access are. So if you're running a multi-tenant uh, server, you may want to make sure that each, each host has its own information. Now sometimes when we go is over really basic information because we have a diverse crowd. I don't want to be over someone's head 
I try not to go too far, too far below, so I want to keep retain some interest. So if anything is too confusing or not robust enough, let us know while we're talking. Now this is varnish. Who knows what varnish is? Okay. Yeah, so if you notice on the prior screens, the log was set up in the application, whether it was Apache or Nginx, you set up the log in that. Well, Ver Varnish uses a separate module for logs, so it's not part of the true Varnish module. It's another module. It's the Varnish NSCA. That's where you set up the logs. And again, it has multifunctionality, and they kind of mimic the Apache log, which means you don't have to learn every another system, so it follows that pretty good. And you can get, again, you can get tons of detailed information out of it, or you can get just the basics that you need. You just have to, you know, understand how to uh, configure it. And we, we just showed a couple quick examples there just to, you know, these are sort of the standard ones that everybody uses. It, it's really not tricky. You just have to use a little bit. You can see what's important for your site because every site's different. And our purpose is to give you a flavor of what goes on at Taste. And so you can del delve dive into what you have because really we can give a four-hour talk on this. Think about it. H HA Proxy, another front end, good, great front end. And look at this, one liner to set the log. Now again, Varnish used it as a separate module. Apache and Nginx, you set it in the configs. Now in HA Proxy, you notice we just got local too. You have to go into our syslog now to configure that. They don't make it easy. Okay. Well, it's our syslog. And okay. Yeah. Yeah, in our syslog, notice that then there, it's, uh, we've got set it up where you can set up all the parameters of setting your log. And some of this stuff is standard, some of it's not when you load the config. And then you can configure it for your number of threads if you've got a lot of CPUs, or you can configure it to write out the logs if the server shuts down. You can set all that up. Next one. And now, now notice in this one, you've got more options again on how you can set it up. And this is for remote logging. Because one common thing is we don't have one server. You may have your front end on multiple servers. You've got your SQL on another server. You've got your varnish on another server. Well, you don't want to be going out to all the different servers and looking at the logs. Well, here's an easy way to set it up. So you can set up a central log and go into even more detailed stuff, which we're not really going to talk about tonight because we just want to hit the basics. So you know that, OK, I can manage my logs. I don't fill up my drive because Obviously, if you've got one volume out there and your logs just grow and grow and grow, you're in trouble. And, and that's important. I have one set up where when we're done, we'll have about six different servers running the system, all disperse, some of them might be at the same location. They might be anywhere in the world. And of course, do your log rotation. Okay. And also in the log rotation, you can set up to do uh, if you have some of the applications on your system to use multi-core, you can use that or you can use the standard ones. There's a nice lot of options there. And again, you're just keeping your logs rotating. And this is important. I've, one of the common factors I've had in the past is a server starts slowing down or stops. They get into the server and you find out that even though they had 100 gig of raw disk space, 95 of it is server logs. Because no one in five years, no one ever rotated or got rid of old logs. They let it grow and grow and grow. So now there are a lot of the tools that make your life easier. And we want basically what happens on the server. But there are a lot of other processes that go on, memory, the processes, the network traffic to your server. And it's endless. It's a lot of work to keep your server healthy. So a lot of free tools that have been developed over the years. There's Munin which is a free tool to monitor. It's pretty popular. Nagios is probably the most popular one out there. And you can write on plugins, do exactly what you want. MonitorX, which is kind of like a very light end one. If you have one server, you want to check out a couple of sites and so forth. And the last two, PHP Servermon, is if you have multiple systems, you're managing different clients, 
you have one dashboard to look at everything for your clients, and there's one that's sort of a monitor that's for your monitoring one port. A couple more ones you can read here. It's great for a small shop. Um, you don't have a 24-hour staff. You could say if, if X happens, then do this. And you'll find a lot of tools borrowed from one to the other. They kind of all look the same. It depends what your needs are. I would go through the list and find exactly what you want. Observium, if you're like uh, using a B free BSD, I have one client, we, we're finally migrating everything off that because I don't remember my BSD commands anymore where anything is. I haven't used that in 15 years. Or we have Cisco in your makeup. It helps you keep in what's going on, but it does have auto discover. Um, like Argus. And then some more even ones. I also use site uptime. I call that the canary in the coal mine. It doesn't tell you anything else but your site's down. But that alert might be good because if you get the alert and five minutes later, it's not back up. It's not a hiccup. It's a problem. And you want to get into your system. So that's been, I'm going to go quickly to show you what Munin looks like. This is actually my server that I, I host on my own things and a couple of low-key sites. And I just show you the nifty things that are on here, just so you can see what it looks like. Here are the access logs, the processes. So if you start getting processed, it's a nice graphical looking thing. It's a great thing to show your clients. If you show your clients the text files, the eyes will glaze over real fast. People like the flashing lights that blink on and off. Um, you can look at this. Mutant's free. You can, there's mutant hosting or you can put it on your server yourself. This is a great one because it tells you what happens to your SQL. Had a case last week. I was up in a place where I had no internet connection whatsoever. And they clicked on update sales and they put the first date of like two years ago to see what would happen and it brought down the server because it's trying to do thousands and thousands of sales. I've removed that page altogether since they don't know how to use it properly. But if you look at this, it would have been spiking all over and started to bring down my other servers if I didn't have fail saves. So that's the basic things on t monitoring tools. There's a lot out there, but it's really important to watch what you're doing. Now, when you cross the street, you should be looking both ways. If you're running a server, you should be watching your logs. You can set up for automatic alerts. So you get a ping on your phone. There's no excuse if you're responsible for this not to have this in. And that's the basics of uh, some server monitoring, some logs, and what questions do we have. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. That was great. Excuse me. Um, all right. So we're gonna have. Uh, you want to run off this, this, uh, yeah, perfect. So we don't even have to set up. So uh, Sean Duncan is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about um, uh, the idea of creating a nonprofit. Before he does that, um, one thing I forgot to mention, and this slide reminded me of it, is so the Drupal Association. They are side note. The Drupal Association helps to keep the community up and running. They're responsible for Drupal.org and all of the kind of like the the ancillary tools around that. Um, there's a lot of really great work that they do. They help us as an organization, the, the NYC Drupal group. Um, the elections are going on right now on Drupal.org for um, the kind of members at large. So uh, do take a minute and go on Drupal.org and, and vote for who you think would be the uh, best person to represent the interests of the Drupal community. Um, and now, excuse me? There are two days left. So that two, two days. I don't usually trust money. Um, okay, so Father Sean, you're up. Great. You need a clicker? You have the clicker? You I have a clicker. It. Here we go. Father Sean, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Woo! So I hope that by uh, the time I'm done, I'll be also joined by Joe Bahana, um, uh, who is going to co present with me. So hopefully he'll get here for the QA. Um, we were, uh, Joe couldn't be here before 8 15, which was our scheduled present time. We're running a little early. So, uh, Joe brought together a group of organizers from uh, the monthly meetup and the Drupal, NY Drupal Camp NYC. There's Joe. Joe Bahana, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Woo! Can we, do the, can we do the two mic thing? There we go. Yes, absolutely. Joe just biked here from Connecticut. Here we go. 
awesome. I was just saying we were. Hey guys, you want me to get the background and then you'll do the thing? Yeah, program's running 15 minutes early and you made it, so. I made it. All right, go ahead. Okay. So a, a few of you have been here for uh, in, in the Drupal community for a long time, but for those who don't, context. We've been doing uh, Drupal camps since the mid 2000s. Um, Matthew, I think you, were you around at that time? Okay. Well, so there was a, a guy named Jacob Redding. He was, uh, you know, one of the earlier uh, planners. He became the uh, executive director of the Drupal Association. In the very first. He was our first. Yeah. yeah. So at the time, we were doing the camps at uh, Polytech, which became NYU, out in Brooklyn. And um, there was uh, some issues with direction. We wanted to do unconferences. Somebody wanted to do a big conference. Um, and there was a concern by Jacob about, uh, and the, uh, the Drupal Association, with protecting the use of the name Drupal, uh, protecting the camps, making sure that money was spent was going to be done properly and that nobody was agenting or that there was no um, like conflicts of interest. So at that time, Jacob had asked me to be um, a local representative for the DA to ensure that that didn't happen. And so we've been doing that for all this time. Uh, last year, we got kind of, or the beginning of this year, we got two pieces of news. The Drupal Association was our fiscal sponsor. All of our revenue or all money that we'd have for camps was kept in the DA's bank account. Our uh, P&L, our profit loss, or our general ledger was public. So if anybody wanted to ask, it was basically out first in Google Sheets, and then eventually it was um, being managed by the DA in Excel. So it was uh, open to uh, and transparent. Beginning of the year, uh, John Jay, which is where we would host the uh, camps, said that they were going to jack us up about 30%, 30 35%, which we could have sustained. The challenge was that uh, we, would re re we would raise money for the next year's camp. So we'd keep money in the camp each year, so it would it would have been a hit on this year. We could have sustained it. So we were looking for other venues. Then the Drupal Association called us up, told us that they could no longer offer the fiscal sponsorship. What had happened was a two couple of camps around the world overextended. In one case, it was $100,000. Um, there was another case, which I don't know exactly what happened. But basically, the DA was put in a situation, both legal and financial, that they just couldn't deal with. The DA also has kind of uh, downsized over the last few years. So we were left with finding alternatives. Uh, we had a community meeting. We had a bunch of folks meeting over the last few months. Father Sean, Holing, uh, there's, there's the pictures. So we've been meeting for a few months. Um, we came up with a couple of uh, solutions, one of which uh, Father Sean's going to chat about now. But we were looking at doing something called Open Collective, uh, which would have been keeping things as they are and just using some third party to manage our funds versus looking at establishing a not-for-profit entity that would help organize and put some structure around Drupal activities in New York. And so I'll pass it over to Father to Sean to uh, explain that. Thanks. So uh, we've met uh, multiple times, the, this group of seven, gang of seven, uh, trying to look at the different solutions. And we're proposing that we create a, a non-profit corporation, uh, Drupal NYC Incorporated, to be a nonprofit New York corporation formed for two purposes. Uh, one purpose would be to educational. Uh, nonprofit corporations can be educational. They can be uh, some other things. Um, the other would be scientific, technically. Um, the educational part is teaching about Drupal. Um, the scientific part is about promoting people contributing to Drupal, um, sprints, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, we At the moment, we have two activities in, in the Drupal NYC community. This is one. Um, uh, Drupal Camp NYC is the other. And you know, we're not talking about, like, this is not like United Way level budget stuff. I mean, I, our, our annual expenditure for camp is like in the eight, $9,000 range. Um, uh, we don't have a, a ton of expenses around the meetup. Um, uh, but it's problematic if that money runs through someone's personal bank account. You know, if you have $9,000 running through your bank account and you were to get audited and the IRS would say, what's this $9,000 worth of income? And you'd say, oh, that's, that's from, my, from my club. Um, that's your income. And you'd have to pay income tax on that. Uh, and if just Joe is managing the money, even through the Drupal account, Drupal Association, um, it's all on Joe to say, no, that's not Drupal. Um, we, 
we are a community. We share the load. So the best way for us to share the load is to have a structure. So this is our proposed structure um, to form this nonprofit uh, incorporated uh, in New York. Uh, we, would we propose to have a five-member board. Um, the, the, the board would be composed of really two classes or two kinds of people uh, in terms of positions. Um, we'd have a chair and deputy chair for two-year terms. We figured they're probably going to work a little harder, so their terms will be a little shorter. Um, and we have uh, just general directors, um, and uh, those would be for three-year terms. And one of the things we wrestled with as a group was like, wow, how, a three-year term, that's, um, that's pretty long. But if we're only going to meet once a year, like to have an annual meeting, if we're going to have only have an election once a year and you're going to stagger terms, um, then whatever the, num whatever the term limit length is, you're going to turn over one over n. Of the of the board every year, so so if you have one year terms, you're turning over the whole year board every year. If you have two year terms, you're turning over half the board every year. Um, you can see how we ended up with three and three year terms. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea to yeah. stagger, just yeah. to, to to add to, to that, was for continuity. Right. You wanted to make sure that you don't want to ever lose. pass the uh, the baton on to the next. Uh, people that are volunteering or being voted the in. The idea is to never lose the institutional memory to not have the whole board leave at once. Uh, you need to pass a mic to Matthew. Well, it won't be on the recording otherwise. Okay. Um, two, two terms that I don't see on there that I'm, that I'm accustomed to seeing in, in, in nonprofits, um, secretary and treasurer. So, um, so we would propose to, uh, for the board to appoint a secretary and a treasurer. Uh, that that tr secretary or treasurer could be a member of the board, um, may not be a member of the board. Uh, uh, so th those positions will will exist, um, but they'll be figured out by the board um, as we go along. Uh, so who chooses the board? Well, nonprofits are structured one of two ways. They're either self-perpetuating, meaning the board chooses the board, um, that doesn't feel very droopily. Um, feels like the community ought to be able to to choose um, the board. Well, who's in the community? You, you don't want to get to a point where it's like, well, who gets you know, the, like a clear line. So we propose that this nonprofit corporation would be a membership corporation um, that you would pay to be a member of this corporation, um, but we'll give you either free or mostly free, depending upon how things go, uh, entrance to Drupal Camp NYC. So if you, basically, if you were going to buy a ticket to have Drupal NYC, you buy a membership in uh, Drupal NYC Incorporated, and when it's time for camp, you get the member discount. Hopefully, yeah. the whole thing. And, and on that, we've been charging like 20, 25 bucks uh, for the Drupal Camp, so that's what we're thinking for the membership. It would also cover the cost of running this, which presently is just the, uh, the meetup. Right now, it's on my credit card, the meetup. But I, I will eventually get reimbursed. It's only a couple hundred bucks a year. But the idea is these, n these costs, again, auditable, transparent to any members to be able to see how, where these monies are getting dispersed. But 20, 25 bucks is what we're looking at for uh, an annual fee. Oh, I went back. Wrong button. So that means we, have to form a, we would have to form, form a corporation. Um, we would have an organizational meeting of the members to adopt the bylaws and elect the first board. Um, and once that was done, we would apply for uh, tax exemption with the IRS. Yes, sir. Do you have an idea of what the costs are involved with starting up a nonprofit, lawyers and accountants and whatever? So um, at the end, there'll be a link. There'll be a bit.ly link to our full proposal, um, like 600 bucks, round numbers. Uh, uh, about $150 of that is buying the... Um, New York Lawyers League, uh, but that's not exactly the right title, but there's a couple of pro bono outfits in New York that, um, and one of them's written like, you know, your, the do-it-yourself guide for nonprofits. Um, they do do pro bono work, uh, but this is really pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think the cutoff is 25,000 and up or something, and we, our annual funds that we keep in our budget are anywhere between six and 8,000. That's, and we keep it there, it's always, neutral. Whatever we've taken out, we put the same amount in on an annual yeah. basis. Yeah. What Joe's talking about is, so when you apply to the IRS, you pay them. 
to do this. And they have actually a two-tier application. Um, there's the expensive 25-page application. And if you don't have a lot of, if you're not talking about a lot of money, there's the online less expensive application. And we're the online less expensive version. Um, yes, sir. Okay, I'll repeat the question. You considered a public benefit corporation. You know, some states have them. I know California, for example, ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which runs the domain name system, you know, the, the dot com and all those things. That's a public benefit corporation. And I think it has less regulation, but it, and I think New York has them as well. So uh, it may just be a way to have something that you don't, it's a not, you don't have to pay taxes on it. To, because it's a public benefit corporation and it doesn't have all this 5012C. Looks like Manny, Manny has a response. Oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, we didn't look at it. Um, one reason being that our funds are deposited with uh, DrupalCon Incorporated, which is actually the corporate name of the Drupal Association, which is a 501c3. Um, some of the regulations around 501c3s transferring their assets to other entities um, it's just a whole lot easier. Uh, now, technically, they're holding that money and it's ours, but also, even more technically, we have donated that money to the, to they now have, they are, as a 501c3, it would just be a lot easier for them to transfer their money laterally. Uh, a great point on that. We pay 10% annually, uh, or I should say the Drupal Association gets 10% for the fiscal sponsorship. So that's approximately $800. And so, it's sort of revenue neutral at this point for the first startup costs of the first year. We looked at something called uh, Open Collective, which would have been a, a nothing like this, but it would have also been 10 to 15% annual. With this way we calculate, we actually get to keep the funds um, after the first year, and so our only costs are gonna be whatever the administrative costs are for, I mean, I don't think there's much of anything. So we've been doing questions and discussion, we've been going along, but we wanna make sure, we're looking for uh, explicit concerns, or we're looking for, yeah, that sounds cool. Um, so uh, there's a detailed proposal online if you want to read all the jot and tittles. It has comments. We, we really appreciate you can go into the Google Doc and put your comments right into the do I turned commenting off. It's <laughs> off? <laughs> we don't want to hear your comments. <laughs> 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 I turned off commenting in the Google Docs interface because we just published, we're publishing this URL and you know what, what open comments are like on the internet. So what I'm gonna ask is, it, I'm also gonna post in the meetup group after this where we can have a in-community discussion. So if you have comments about the proposal, I'd, I'd like it in the meetup. The, there's also uh, Drupal NYC as a Slack channel, which everybody, <laughs> Everybody who is involved in this is, is there and always very happy and willing to, to have conversations on Slack, so that's another good place. I was going to, now the timing doesn't work at all, but I was going to just say, yeah, that sounds good, just, you know, in, in terms of the feedback you're looking for. Um, but for me, personally, I've been, I've been around for 200 years in this group, and um, I think it makes a lot of sense that, uh, um, that this, this is kind of like a, an obvious step forward. Um, I think first, first, second, I thank you guys for, for taking the initiative to kind of like jump on this and, and help figure this out. Um, the last thing I would say is, uh, is more a question, which is let's assume that, you know, we're, we're going to go forward with this. Um, well, actually a question is, is what will the triggering point be to say, let's go? Like, is everybody in the room going to vote or say yes or no? Or it, like, that's a great question. We, uh, we are, we want to be super conservative about this. Mm -hmm. so we want to get, I, I, I think it would be like a, a 30 more day feedback from the community. We're, we're going to short of going out to people and, and really starting to ask them to like mm -hmm. in writing, give us the feedback. We really don't want to take this step, but it's, it's twofold. The first, so I've been doing this a long time. I intend to keep volunteering, but it's it's not uh, appropriate for me to continually be right. that that leader on this. It has to be broad. And the second, the Drupal community is like a river, right? It keeps flowing. New people keep coming in. We we the big risk here is we have to keep passing the baton to new people who are going to volunteer, and and that's a, that's a crucial part of this 501c3 is setting up a mechanism to be able to do that. It won't work unless we get people who are newly entering in uh, involved in this kind of process? It, if there is no consensus, and if there is no, like people are just like, no, this is, uh, is, is that kind of the end of the, of Drupal NYC? Like what, what happens, I guess is my question. 
So my proposal, um, we've been kicking around time limits. I'm happy with 30 days, but my, I don't want to give the absent or silent members like blocking rights forever. Um, uh, but I also am really want to hear from the community. This is Drupal. So uh, we were going to say, we'll present it tonight, we'll put it in the meetup, we'll, we'll put it in the community Slack, and we'll say, we'd like to hear, you know, we're going to open commenting for, I'm fine with 30 days. And sure. Sure. That's, that's fine. Uh, well, the, the other thing is, is I think uh, Im implicit in Alex's statement is, let's assume people say absolutely it's a terrible idea. It, I don't think that's going to happen. But if it did, th this meetup would continue on as it has been. Uh, whether it, the meetup's on my credit card or not is up for you know <laughs> discussion. But um, the uh, the Drupal camps do become an issue. Uh, we would probably end up having to go to Open Collective. We would still need to have people. Scott and I have been working, and Father Sean have been working on the camps for many years now. We, we do have to pass on to new people to start. They have to show, other people have to start stepping up to do these camps annually. I, I can't do it for forever, and it's happy to train people how to do that. So, so and this is Drupal. So if you, you know, this is like essentially going to be like an issue in the issue queue. So if you say, in, if, if you go in the issue queue and say, this is a terrible idea. The people that filed the issue are going to say, okay, so where's your patch? So uh, if the community thinks this is a terrible idea, I'm interested to hear that. But I'm also interested to hear to say, well, what else should we do? Because um, just sort of pretending that we don't have a structure, it's not so much, it ha it's, it, it's wor worked okay, but it's time to do something else. Yeah? Um, I'm trying to think of a way to get consolidated feedback. I kind of feel like we won't do ourselves any favor if we have people posting comments in Slack and maybe on a Google Doc and maybe folks have ideas for do we want to spread a survey around and people I, can I can open commenting on the document or back up. Yeah, I mean um, either way. I guess if we get a bunch of spam, we, we can shut it down. We want feedback because we want participation and people to step up for ownership. So like what's the best way to actually get our yeah, there, it's a great point. Uh, Monty brought up an idea of just uh, having it like in, in GitHub, right? Like put, putting in a repo. But that, that could be a disincentive for people who don't use Git um, in our community. But it's, it's a good idea, and it's, it's a plausible one. Okay, what about, what, what about posting a link in both of those places to the old school groups.drupal.org page? That's the other way. That, the other thing I was going to say you is know. the GDO uh, NYC page could be a great... Still exists. Yeah. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll work out that. I, I meet up, it may not be the best place, except that's where all our membership is right, right. now, so. But okay. So we'll, let's work out those logistics and the best way to do it, we'll just, we'll put it out but there. You're, but uh, you're right, having comments in five places isn't gonna help everybody. Okay. Um, we also could open an issue, have an issue queue. Uh, there, there was one final thing beyond this and into the camps. Uh, if anybody works at a university, does anybody here work at a college or university? Okay. There is a, in New York City? <laughs> I saw the big Michigan. I saw the Michigan. <laughs> it's the uh, big yellow M. But there is an inn at colleges and universities. I've dis now discovered, because I've called a couple of the colleges, if you are a student or if you work there, the the price it, it's it's um, it's like a club it's like a two hundred dollar to get the premises is so inexpensive so if anybody knows of anybody if you've had a client or you've done work at university or college we could somehow network with somebody who is working on the campus somebody we could get back in at John Jay if somebody's driving it from inside well I I'm a student at Brooklyn College but it's it's you know, pe people are they Manhattan Drupal say shop or the WordPress. People in Manhattan say, that's a long way away. Yeah. Brooklyn, it's we can bring it back to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> they were a nice camp. All right, so we will post, we will post um, where the consolidated feedback will take place. Thank you, Suzanne, right? Susie, thank you for that suggestion, Susie. And um, look forward to further development and completion. Yeah, oh yes.
Well, uh, how many people do you expect uh, to be members, you know, based on, I guess, historical attendance of meetups and, and the different events that have been run in the area? Um, so our, our camps run like about 150 or so in the past. So if, you can't, if you've been coming to Drupal Camp in New York and you're from New York, yeah, I would expect you to join because um, you're kind of like prepaying your attendance. In, um, in, in truth, anyone, like if, if the model becomes what we, what we said, where you get a discounted membership, uh, like a discounted ticket to the camp, it, your ticket to the camp can simply be a membership in the organization as well. Yeah. You know, so however way you look at it, and these, these kinds of things we work out, but right. I think 150 is probably a good, a good yeah. estimation. We tip on average on meetup.com, we get about between 90 and, uh, and 105 um, attendees RSVP. And th this, 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 we'll learn that this month. Um, but, uh, uh, and then we get about 50 to 60% of that um, who actually attend. Um, so there's, on any given month, there's 100 people who are, who are actually looking at the org. So I don't think 150 total is an unreasonable number because those are not the same, hun excuse me, not the same 100 people every month. No, and then I, looked, I, I honestly, th now this is about the s essentially sustaining status quo, but then I have ambitions. Um, there are a lot of other 501c3s out there in, in New York and in the world, but we're focusing on New York. I'd love to have a partnership with Girls Who Code um, and teach about and start expanding the pool of uh, Drupal developers. There are other organizations that are teaching about coding in other underrepresented um, uh, communities, uh, persons of color. I'd like to see us stop, you know, bemoaning and actually partner with some of those uh, those nonprofits and actually make a difference. Yeah, I'm very good at moaning, bemoaning. So, <laughs> see, finally, one of my jokes landed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Tip your waiters. Try the veal. Okay. All right, Sean and uh, and and Joe. Thank you guys really, uh, and also the other uh, uh, four or five people who've really been kind of uh, taking this bull by the horns. It's a it's a you know it's kind of a tricky it's a tricky moment to get us to the point where we can actually you know change as an organization. We haven't had much change as an organization in 10, 12 years. You know, I'd say it's the last time we actually sat down and like did some introspection and. We should make Jacob do it again. That would be awesome. Jacob has a great Drupal powder blue tuxedo that he wears from time to time. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Basically. Um, okay. Um, thank you guys, everybody, for coming. Um, the next meetup is August first. Uh, typically, our meetups are the first Wednesday of the month. It's this time around, the first Wednesday of the month was July fourth, so that was not a very good day to try and do this. Um, but uh, please do tell your friends and neighbors and your neighbors' friends to come on Wednesday, August 1st. Sign up at meetup.com. Please remember to put your full name so I don't have to chase you down because they're finicky about security here at the Rockefeller Center. Um, and, and only one name. From time to time, I have somebody who like fills out their name. My name is Dave and Mike and John Smith. And they don't let you do that. Um, OK, downstairs, Bill's Bar. Um, uh, Fastly is uh, buying you a drink. Uh, go down, meet some people, have some conversation, and uh, maybe give some ideas to Sean and, uh, and Joe about, uh, about where you think uh, Drupal NYC should go. That's it. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.